Well, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this morning for the Crop Talk webinar. We're going to be um, discussing weed control. Yesterday, we talked about it in Northwest Kansas. Today, the focus is in North Central Kansas. And so Sandra Wick is our Post Rock Extension District um, agronomy agent, and she's been with us for many, many years. And so she's going to be kind of the person in charge on the webinar today. All righty. Well, good morning again. Well, glad you could join us on this crispy morning and it sounds like it's going to be with us for a few more mornings and I know you guys have some calves out there and you're breaking eyes so um, I, I, I don't um, um, I, I sympathize with you because I know how cold it is out there but again we're going to go on so we can keep on time here so we're going to advance the slide and as you know um, as the music was going it takes a team and it takes a village to make this happen so you may recognize some of the extension agents there in Northwest Kansas. So we're up in the, the quarter of the state of Kansas up there. So we cover a pretty large area on the east side, uh, Post Rock, which is in Mitchell, Jewel County, clear to the Colorado border, which is in the Sunflower District and down south uh, by the Walnut Creek District. So again, we appreciate all the agents that are working. There's behind the scenes people that you don't see them but they are making this happen. So we want to thank them all for all the work to make this happen. Okay, before we get started here, we have a few uh, housekeeping rules so we can make this go smoothly. Um, if you're using Zoom, okay, um, we want to interact with you. So we want you to be able to um, interact with us and ask your questions. Um, if you're using Zoom on the little um, icon over here, down on the bottom of your screen, you see something that says Q&A, okay? That is where we want you to type in your subject matter questions. So it's really important to us that you are able to ask questions right here at the get-go. So, But we're going to save the questions until the end and so we can have time for all the speakers. So please be sure that you use the Q&A box for your subject matter questions. There's also a chat box at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. That is if you have any technical questions, if for some reason you can't hear us, if for some reason you can't see the slides, anything like that, just simply put your comment in the chat box and we will have somebody um, look into that so everybody can um, take part in our um, virtual crop talk this morning. If you are watching on YouTube um, live, you can also type in your questions. However, first you will need to create an account and it's very, very simple. It just, and there's a little icon button that says create account. Um, you type your name in and then you can simply type the comments in. We will have an agent watching that as well. And then we will pass it on to the speakers as well. If you still can't get that to work, you simply can email your questions to Jeannie Falk Jones uh, at jfalkjones at ksu.edu. So hopefully one of those three ways we can get your questions answered today. If for some re reason we uh, run out of time, we will have the speakers answer those questions and get back to you as well. Okay, another way that we would like you to interact with us today is called Pull Everywhere. And so it's a really great way uh, for you to in interact and engage with us during the crop talk presentations. So there's two different ways that you can do this. You can open your web browser and go to simply pollev.com forward slash KSU and open your browser and it will give you instruction. You just follow the, the cues and then you can get logged in or on your cell phone here, you can simply type text in, and we've got a little icon over here. The two, you put 22333, and on the bottom it says enter message in KSU, and then you hit send right here, this button. Once you hit send, you'll get another message that says you're um, enrolled or you're, you're set up to go with Poll Everywhere, and then you simply answer the questions. So remember, two different ways. Go to your web browser and just go to this website or text in 22333 in the two up here at the top and then enter your message at KSU and then send it. Okay, so we're going to see if this works. Oh, and we need to clear these out. Uh, Jeannie, do you know how to clear those out? <laughs> Oh, 
Unless we just go on and keep doing it. Okay, so it looks like it's coming in now and you guys are voting, but we want to know how cold it was outside this morning. Um, I'm up here in Smith Center um, and it was about four degrees. So it looks like most of you were in that maybe one to five and they're still coming in. So it looks like all of that is working now. So you kind of know how this works. And during that presentation, the speakers will have some slides just like this, and then you can put in A, B, C, or D. So it's as simple as that, or E, if, it's, if the answer might be um, uh, none of the above. Okay. Lastly here, um, if you are on here for CCA credit, there's two different ways that uh, you can get your credit. Uh, the first way is to simply email Jeannie Falk Jones, and that's jfalkjones at ksu.edu at the beginning here and at the end. We need your name and your CCA number. So again, at the beginning and at the end with your name and CCA number. And that helps us really keep things straight so we can make sure that you get credit. Also, if you on your phone have a certified crop advisor app. Uh, we will be having the QR code up at the end of the session. So you can do it either way, either email or use the QR code and then you can just scan that in at the end of the session. Okay, are there any questions coming in so far, Craig? Uh, no, we don't have anything so okay. far. Okay, great. All righty. So we're going to go on and get started here. Um, again, this is our second week of the Crop Talk. So we are so glad that you are here. Um, yesterday, we, we did have these two speakers, Dr. Sarah Lancaster and Dr. Vipin Kumar, uh, gave their weed management and that pesky Palmer Amaranth presentation, focusing more on Northwest Kansas. So today, we're gonna focus more on North Central Kansas. So um, Sarah's our Extension Weed Management Specialist and she provides farmers uh, with lots of information to help them develop uh, a profitable integrated weed management program. And I'm gonna go on and tell you a little bit about uh, um, Bippin. He is at our Hayes Research Center with K-State Research and Extension. And he is one of our weed scientists and his research has focused on uh, the herbicide-resistant Palmer amaranth and kochia, which, as you know out there, is two of our most aggressive weeds out in our cropland. So we're going to start with Sarah. So I'm going to stop sharing so then Sarah can share her screen. All right. Thank you, Sandra. Let's get this presentation rolling. All right, thanks guys for joining us today. I'm looking forward to spending some time, probably the next 20, 25 minutes or so, talking with you a little bit about layered residual herbicides. So as a little bit of background of why um, we're talking about this today, Sandra and Jeannie had sent out some surveys to um, folks that are, are likely participants today, or likely attendees today, and this was one of the topics that, that came up on the survey. So we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what layered residuals do, how they work, and, and some other considerations there. Before we jump into that, let me click on the right screen here. All right, before we jump into that, I uh, wanted to give just a handful of industry updates. Um, obviously, dicamba has been in the news a lot in the last several months. Um, one of the things that was in the news here this fall was that Extend Flex soybeans have been approved. So one important thing to note about Extend Flex soybeans is that in addition to dicamba and glyphosate, they're also resistant to glufosinate or Liberty, okay? So this is gonna be important for folks to pay attention to because we still have just regular Roundup Ready Extend uh, soybeans on the market this year as well. So it's gonna require a little bit of careful attention to record keeping and communicating with your custom applicators and such to make sure that Liberty is being used in Extend Flex soybeans, and it is not being used in Roundup Ready Extend soybeans. So just a little, uh, little bit of a reminder there. 
One of the other pieces of information that has been important related to the new um, dicamba restrictions is the requirement to add a volatility reduction agent or a pH buffer. So these products are intended to help prevent that um, volatilization of dicamba after a successful or after a labeled application of the product. So, um, you know, this has been a moving target, guys. These these uh, products, uh, Bayer's decision has been to license their VRAs or volatility reduction agents to a number of different manufacturers. So we are continuing to see new products being added to this list um, on a regular basis for the Bayer products. Okay, the BASF product is called Centris. Um, it is actually going to go on at a lower application rate. Eight ounces per acre is going to be the recommended rate there. And Centris is the only brand name to look for for that pH buffer. So those two products, you can tell by the different um, rate requirements, they work a little bit differently. They've got different active ingredients. And so BASF is considering Centris to be a pH buffer. That's the terminology they're using. So um, just be on the lookout for those. And please remember... Um, you're going to have to have a receipt to prove that you purchased enough for all of your um, over-the-top dicamba applications this summer. A couple of uh, other items to think about here as we think about industry updates. Some new herbicides uh, were added to the 2021 Chemical Weed Control Guide, and I just wanted to draw your attention to those. In corn, we had two products based on impact. Um, one is Impact Core, which is Impact plus Acetochlor. So give you a little bit of um, that layered residual approach um, in your corn system. And then the other product there is Sinate, which is Impact plus Liberty. So a post-emergent product there. Um, in soybeans, we have two new labels, but honestly, they're not new products at all. Um, Kyber is a Corteva product that is the exact same um, combination, even the same ratios as Fierce MTZ. And Panther MTZ is the exact same product as Dimetric Charged. So a few options on the market, but really no new chemistry there. Um, other label updates to be aware of. Uh, FMC added soybean to the labels for Anthem Flex and Authority Edge, and also extended the um, window of application for Anthem Max all the way through V6, it was V3. So again, thinking about those layered residuals, um, that's an important component there. The other item that I want to point out to you guys is the, the Zidua, um item on the bottom of that slide. BASF is saying that they are anticipating a 2021 label that will allow application of Zidua through V8 corn. So this will be um, a longer application window for Zidua and corn. Um, I want to point out that that label, that updated label, is not available yet. Um, in conversations with BASF last week, though, they indicate that they are still planning on that being approved for 2021. We shall see um, what happens with the new folks in the EPA and how all of that proceeds. But that that's something you can look for, um, if not this year, in the very near future. Um, I think it's also important that we keep our eye on what the EPA is doing in terms of herbicide re-registration. So most of you guys know this is a, a regular process. All, all pesticides have to go through a re-registration process where the EPA evaluates new data that has been generated since previous registrations. And so atrazine um, is currently in the midst of a re-registration review. Um, they did release, EPA did release a decision in September um, but we are far from having a final decision. Um, there are still a couple of more assessments that we're waiting for. One of them the, that I could find a deadline for is all the way to next fall. So we're at least, you know, a calendar year probably away from um, looking at having a final decision on atrazine. I did go through that interim decision and summarize the, what was listed as changes there. Um, and so some things to think about as we consider this and other re-registration reviews, the EPA is really starting to focus in on application practices that affect off-target movements. And they're thinking about this in the context of this Endangered Species Act. So looking at how that product affects endangered species in neighboring 
um, environments and how we can adjust our application practices in order to minimize that effect. So keeping the product where we need it to be. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about what are the two most challenging weeds in your crops? We've already got some answers rolling in um, as far as what are these two most challenging weeds? What do you guys think? I look forward to seeing what you guys text in. We've got ragweed. We've got amaranth species, palmer amaranth, kochia. Mare's tail. We'll talk about mare's tail a little bit toward the end of my slide set. Excellent. Yeah, if you can just text in your answer, we'll give it just a couple more seconds and see how this changes. <clears throat> Palmer, <clears throat> excuse me, Palmer Amaranth seems to be uh, stealing the show here. That's not a big surprise, right? So good. Thank you guys for doing that. It helps me um, as I ask this question different parts of the state and, you know, from year to year and season to season, it helps me to see what's on your all's mind. Um, like I said, we kind of expect to see Palmer um, on that list, but I think there's some other things that maybe we need to be paying attention to. So, all right, let's talk about overlapping residuals. So corn herbicide application calendar, just as an example here. So let's think about when we're applying these herbicides. So maybe some of you guys, well, we're past the time for fall applications, right? And maybe some of you are thinking about um, early pre-plan applications. We've been talking about kochia and some of the e-updates recently for the agronomy department. So, you know, now is a good time to be thinking about, even though it's frozen outside, uh, getting out there and making sure that you're going to have that early pre-plant to control your kochia, right? Because with most weeds, the, and kochia is included, the best time to control them is before we ever even see them, okay? And so that means knowing when those weeds are going to emerge. Now, that being said, your pre-emergent herbicide application, guys, it's kind of like building the foundation for your house. If your foundation is no good, anything you do after that is gonna be a little bit wonky. So I wanna encourage you guys to just spend a little bit of extra time thinking about how you're going to make that pre-emergent program you're using as strong as it can be in whatever crop you're in, if it's, it's corn or soybeans or, or milo, um, think about that pre-emergent program. It really is your foundation. And as you think about your production budgets this year, you know, prices have kind of gone up a little bit. So if you're thinking about maybe spending some more money on your weed control program, I would encourage you to think about how you're going to adjust your pre-program and getting that good foundation and then coming back in with a planned early post application that's going to include a residual herbicide if you're not going to have that good crop canopy that we need. So that early post application and then scouting. As we think about herbicide resistant weeds, scouting after those early post applications and coming back in with something timely and effective um, is gonna be super important for managing weed seed banks. So just some things to keep in mind kind of in general as we think about herbicide applications and where to, to, where to use them or how to use them. So, um, Palmer amaranth, right? That's our favorite weed to hate these days. I pulled some of the environmental data from the mesonet for haze. So looking at the soil temperature, we know that Palmer amaranth will germinate pretty well anytime the soil temperature is above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you look at this figure on the left here, you can see um, that through um, much of May all the way through um, October in Hayes, we have soil temperatures that are conducive to Palmer amaranth germination. So if the moisture is there, there's a good chance that that weed is going to be coming up all throughout that growing season. Okay, this is why those layered residuals are so important. We want to make sure we're doing what we need to do to prevent those weeds from coming up late in the season. And you know, Palmer is amazing. It'll set seed at six inches tall. So we don't want to have that seed being produced. 
Um, the other bit of data that I pulled was this growing degree day accumulation. And so we know that Palmer has a base temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So anytime the average daily temperature is above about 60 degrees, we're going to start seeing that plant grow, um, you know, and pretty aggressively as the temperatures increase. So you can see here um, in, in April, we start to see those temperatures, those growing degree days start to accumulate and they don't really plateau or level off until we get all the way out here until October. So that's telling me that if that Palmer amaranth is able to germinate, it is going to be able to grow all through uh, that season, that crop production season. So residual herbicides, those pre-emergent products, that's the foundation for our weed control program. The, the downside of residual herbicides is that they kind of wear out, right? As they're out there in the environment, the soil microorganisms start to break them down or maybe they are moved out of the root zone by water. So the, the effectiveness of those residual herbicides tapers off over time. Now, we also know that shade from our crop canopy is a pretty darn good and pretty inexpensive herbicide, right? But the problem that we run into is that sometimes we don't get that canopy in enough time to have it really support or fill in the gap that's being left by that um, residual herbicide that's being broken down. So we think about residual herbicides in this breakdown process. We talk about herbicide persistence, and that's just a, a kind of fancy way of, see, of saying that um, how long the herbicide is active in the soil, okay? So when the companies are working on their application rates for herbicides, they're really looking for a sweet spot. They want to make sure they have um, at least enough herbicide to get a reasonable duration of weed control, but they don't want to have so much herbicide that they're causing injury to subsequent crops. They don't want carryover, right? Carryover is something we've talked about in some other presentations this winter. When we talk about herbicide, we use a term called half-life, okay? And that's basically just telling us how long it takes for half of a given concentration of herbicide to dissipate or to disappear, okay? So this graph, um, I kind of tried to illustrate that concept. So if we start with 100% of the herbicide, in this example, this product has a 20-day half-life, okay? So after 20 days, we would have 50%. After 40 days, we would have 25%. 12 and a half percent and so on. That's how that half-life works. One of the questions I often get from producers is how do some of these residual herbicides compare um, in terms of efficacy? So uh, one of the sort of go-to references for a weed scientist is something called the herbicide handbook. So I went to the herbicide handbook and pulled half-life information for the herbicides listed here. So these are all herbicides that have some level of residual activity um, and can be used in, in corn, sorghum, and in some places, or I'm sorry, corn and sorghum and, and soybean um, production depending on the product, right? So half-lives here range from our friend atrazine, which has a half-life of about 60 days. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a few minutes. And then on the short end, we've got isoxafluidol or balance. Uh, which has a half-life of as little as a half a day, okay? So that one's broken down pretty quickly. This half-life roughly translates into duration of weed control. So two of the products that get kind of compared most often would be acetochlor, so things like Warrant or Harness, and esmetolachlor, so products like Dual. And so what, what I want you to see here is that acetochlor has a shorter half-life that's associated with a shorter duration of control um, as reported in the herbicide handbook based on published uh, research. Okay, so compare that to the same, same values for metolachlor, 30 to 50 days, so a considerably longer half-life, translates to a little bit longer residual activity. Now, there are other factors you're going to want to consider when you think about using these products and we'll talk about some more of those toward the end of the, the slide set here. So what are some factors that influence microbial degradation? So microbial degradation is the primary method that or the primary process that determines how long those herbicides are gonna stick around in the soil. So some things that influence it, sorption. So that herbicide being stuck uh, to the soil, 
And then another factor is previous application. So atrazine is kind of the poster child for this idea of what we call enhanced degradation. So after somewhere around about five applications of atrazine, you're going to start seeing a shorter um, effective life of that product because the microorganisms in the soil have adapted to having that atrazine there and they're getting used to having it as a food source. And so they break it down faster, okay? But this happens for other products as well. This is an example of an ALS inhibiting herbicide. I want you to see here, the solid black line represents the degradation. So how fast that herbicide disappeared when there were no prior applications of the product. And then the dashed line is looking at how fast that herbicide disappeared when there was a history of application of that herbicide. So it happens for, for um, many herbicides, this, this phenomenon of enhanced degradation. So just another reason to think about kind of keeping your herbicide rotation um, pretty varied. Another big environmental factor that influences herbicide degradation is soil moisture, okay? So we often talk about this fact when we think about carryover issues, right? We know that carryover issues are more likely to occur during dry uh, winters because there hasn't been as much microbial activity. So these graphs, they're pretty busy. I apologize for that. But what they're looking at here, this is the percent of the, the compound that's remaining. The line I want you to pay attention to is this line that's marked with the dark circles. Okay, that's isoxofluidal, that's balance. So in a dry soil, we have balance breaking down and we start to see a pretty sharp decline in the concentration somewhere between seven and 14 days. Okay, if we come over here, let's just look at the, the graph here on the far right in a, in a more moist environment. If we look again at our dark circle, we have very rapid breakdown of that isoxafluidyl, of that parent compound imbalance. So, you know, you start to see a, a marked decrease here, you know, before a week is up. So sometime around three days, okay? So that's the impact that soil moisture can have on herbicide degradation and how long our residual products are gonna last. The other big environmental factor that influences microbial degradation is soil temperature, okay? Um, just like we are much more comfortable when it's sunny and 70 outside than when it's five degrees and cloudy outside, soil microorganisms are also more comfortable at a little bit warmer temperatures. Um, they do often have maximum thresholds um, to think about, but in general, the warmer the soil, the more microbial activity you're going to have. So um, these data were collected from soil that was held at 43 degrees and at 60 degrees. Okay, so look here at the, the 43 degree um, data set here. They were able to detect herbicide all the way out. You know, they're still getting meaningful concentrations here over 120 days out from the, the initial application. If you come over here to uh, the 60 degree temperature, they didn't even carry their graph out past uh, 75 days. Okay, so this product was breaking down much faster um, in the warmer temperatures. And honestly, guys, when, when I was working in the lab looking at herbicide uh, dissipation, the ideal temperature for most microorganisms is somewhere around 75 or 80 degrees. 80 is really a pretty sweet spot for them. And so when we were looking at, at degradation in the lab, that was our target temperature. So, you know, you would anticipate even more rapid degradation at that, that 80 degree-ish uh, range. All right, let's go back to our schematic here. We've got our residual herbicide down. We've got our crop canopy coming in, but not soon enough. We know that we can have weed emergence once that crop, that herbicide concentration gets below an effective level and prior to adequate shade being provided by the crop canopy. If we come in with a planned early post-emergent application that does not include a layered residual, we are not going to stop that weed emergence, okay? We need to have, if, if we're having questions here about how good our canopy is gonna be, we need to be thinking about stopping that weed emergence with residual herbicides applied with the post application. 
So, you know, the name of the game here, guys, I've said this before this morning, we're, we're talking about trying to prevent weed escapes. Those weed escapes are still going to produce seed. Okay. In fact, uh, these data come from, from Texas. We know everything's bigger in Texas, right? But these are still good numbers. They were looking at Palmer amaranth escapes all across the state. So all the way from the Panhandle down to the coastal bend area. And they found that Palmer amaranth escapes so after a weed control program, the escapes can produce up to 7 million seeds per acre. Okay, that starts to have implications when we think especially about the possibility of those seeds being herbicide resistant, right? We've all seen something like this in our cornfields. This uh, sorry little, in this case, this is a water hemp plant here, came up, um, broke through that, that residual herbicide, came up, and is just kind of languishing, just kind of blah just kind of there among the corn, but that guy had seeds, okay? So that guy has seeds. There's a reason that this plant or these plants were able to break through that residual herbicide faster than some of the other seeds that were probably in that seed bank. And that's probably because they potentially have some sort of low level of resistance. You know, it's not always resistance, but you know, obviously these plants are much more likely to have that trait that makes them able to emerge through that low, lower concentration of the herbicide. And that's not something we want to spread, okay? Especially when we start to think about things like metabolic resistance. If you listen to agriculture today this morning, you might think about metabolic resistance. So I'm um, again, just thinking about what this looks like. So we're going to come in here with our post-emergent application and we're going to add a residual herbicide. And our goal is to get the herbicide concentration in the soil to, to last at an effective level all the way through canopy closure. Oh, snap. Um, I was going to ask you guys how long or what herbicides you have used as layered residual herbicides. Let me come in here and why is it not working? And make one change. Everything appears to be okay. That is interesting. All right, well, let's call an audible here, guys. Let's do one thing. Um, if you're Listening to us on uh, Zoom, can you just go into the chat box and tell me what herbicides have you used as a layered residual herbicide? What herbicides have you used as a layered residual herbicide? Oh, okay, one thing, ha! All right, we've got this, we've got this. All right, I'm sorry guys. I made some changes yesterday and yeah, here they are. So what herbicides have you used as a layered residual herbicide? Now we're cooking. We've got Outlook. Great choice. Zidua. Great choice. What else are we getting? So use your text, use your web browser. If you're, if you want to use the chat box, that's fine too. Whatever works for you. But I love looking at um, how all these things compare together. Halex GT, Atrazine, Warrants. Excellent. Someone else said Outlook. Outlook and Warrant seem to be the top vote getters so far. So the trick to reading these things is the larger the word, the larger the percentage of the, the answers that gave that word. So Warrant seems to be one of the big ones. Okay, excellent. Thank you guys for, uh, for that feedback. That again is helpful to me. As I think about, you know, what you guys need to know about and, and what, what I need to be looking at as a, a research program. So I appreciate that. All right, so I mentioned that we were going to look at some other things that affect that choice. So we talked about um, earlier, we talked about um, half life of these products and how long we can expect weed control. When we think about overlapping residuals, one of the other important factors to consider is how much rainfall they need for activation. Some of you guys might be growing under irrigation and you've got an advantage over dry land folks, right? But the, the labels for the various products provide different amounts or provide information about the amount of rainfall that is required for activation. 
So the two that are the, the least would be Callisto and the Warrant and the Harness products at about a quarter of an inch, okay? Dual is actually on the high end. It requires, according to the label, one half to one inch of rainfall, okay? So something to think about as you're considering which of these products you want to go with as an overlapping residual herbicide. Another factor that we need to think about is uh, growth stage restrictions, okay? So there's not a ton of difference among these products when you look within the corn labels um, or when you look within the grain sorghum or uh, the grain sorghum labels. There are some differences when we look at some of the soybean labels, okay? So just be aware of the restrictions associated with the product that you are using, okay? So let's look at what this might look like um, in the field situation or in a field situation, in a research situation. These data actually come from my counterpart and the University of Nebraska. Um, and he's looking at control of water hemp, velvet leaf, and green foxtail based on warrant applications either 14 days before planting at planting or then sequential applications at planting and e-post, at planting and late post, or actually three applications here in these bars on the far uh, right side of your screen. So the takeaway here, this black line represents 95% control. We would consider that excellent control. Um, if you're thinking about the ratings in the weed control guide, be excellent control. Um, so all of these sequential applications provided us excellent control, okay? greater than the, the pre-only applications, whether that was two weeks before planting or at planting, okay? And then these data are, are coming from a, a study that one of my graduate students is working on as part of his thesis work. So we're just looking at how some of these integrated management practices kind of play together in the various herbicide resistant soybean systems. So looking at um, Enlist soybeans and Liberty Link GT27 soybeans, um, in these data, there were no differences between the two soybean systems. And then we had different row spacings, 15 inch and 30 inch row spacings. Um, and I put both of those data points on this graph, but statistically there were no differences in the weed control among those row spacings. Um, these data actually, I should mention, they were collected in Ottawa. So I know it's a different environment than where you guys are working, but the point that I wanna make, I think still holds, um, even though these data were collected in a different location. So, so bear with me here just a minute. And then the four herbicide treatments that we had, we had a low treatment, which was a pre only, we had a medium treatment, which was a pre-application followed by an appropriate post-emergent application for the system. And then we had a high input system. So that post-emergent application in that case included that layered residual herbicide. And then we had a hand-weeded study where we went in and, and after we applied that, that high input system, any weeds that came through, um, the students hoed out, okay? So, Again, my black line here, um, we're looking at 95% control. And then the, the segments here, we've got rating data four, eight, and then on the far right, 16 weeks after planting. Okay, so let's, let's focus in here on these 16 week after planting data. And here's what I want you guys to see. We had excellent control um, among all three of those treatments that included a post-emergent herbicide application. We had good pre-emergent products um, down, and then we had timely post-emergent herbicide applications, okay? So layered residual herbicides are important for making sure that we don't have um, weed escapes, but it is possible to design programs that um, are very effective. Now, let's ask this question. I've been talking about 95% weed control um, as, as good, right? So those, those programs without that layered residual, they probably have 95, 97, 98% weed control. We are not going to see a yield reduction from that level of weed control, right? It's going to, that's excellent weed control. But when we think about herbicide resistance, particularly in the context of a weed like Palmer amaranth, let's think about what, what might happen here. So 
these numbers come from the literature as far as you know what to expect in terms of um, escapes and the number of seeds produced per plant. So if we think about kind of a typical uh, number of escapes here, we might end up with 350,000 seeds per acre, 20% viable seed, 40% emergence. And let's say here, let's say this was last year. So this year, we're going to get 95% control. Okay, that's still leaving us with roughly half a million seeds per acre that are going back into the soil seed bank. And if you consider the fact that there's a probability that those plants might be resistant, um, this data comes from some re recent research out of Dr. Jugulam's lab, this figure here that I plugged in, that is a, a possibility that we will have half a million resistant plants um, that could come from our soil seed bank in the next three to five years, okay, based on what we know about the, the life of Palmer amaranth seed in a no-till uh, setting, okay? So even though we're getting excellent control, we still need to think about what are what is the seed production going to cost us in future years? Now, Palmer is not the only tough weed that we have to deal with. Uh, mare's tail is problematic too. Um, and probably, honestly, um, I will point a finger at myself here, not getting enough attention in terms of, of weed management programs. So we're going to work on that. Uh, but here's some data, same types of scenarios, just went through the literature and pulled um, information related to mare's tail. And again, we're still up here, even though we don't think about mare's tail as being quite as prolific a seed producer as Palmer amaranth, you're still looking at, you know, six digit numbers of seeds that are being returned to the seed bank that are potentially herbicide resistant. So excellent control, um, quite frankly, guys, is not enough, especially when we think about um, the development of metabolic herbicide resistant. We need perfect control, okay? Um, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow, but I think it's where we need to be. Um, I did wanna share a little bit of weed control data. Um, these are from some plots that we put in here in Manhattan last year, this was in a no-till setting, um, and I have a really excellent mare's tail population in this field. Unfortunately, it's not a very large field, but what we looked at, we were looking at some programs in enlist systems, okay, looking at those 2,4-D-based programs. So we had, um, here we had enlist plus roundup just followed by enlist plus roundup. So that would be kind of analogous to that um, medium input system that I showed you guys from the common water hemp data collected at Ottawa. Here we have um, Enlist plus Roundup followed by an application with a layered residual. Here we have our residual herbicide applied at the pre-slot, but no residual in the post-slot. Here we have Authority as a residual in the pre-slot and Anthem Max as a residual in the post-application timing. And then also this last treatment here, we have Fierce Pre and Perpetuo Post. So two, two applications of residual herbicide. And again, we had really outstanding control with all of these treatments. They all worked quite well. Um, but 2020 was quite frankly a pretty ideal a uh, year for doing weed control, for getting good weed control. We had timely rains, plants weren't really stressed. Um, these her applications were made when it wasn't terribly hot. And the other thing to think about, I mean, I'm kind of gonna, well, no, we had great applications, okay? All right, those were the data that I wanted to share with you guys today. I know that Jeannie and Sandra had a reminder about getting the chemical weed control guide in the slides at the beginning of the, the session today. So I just want to add a reminder to that. You can get it from your county extension office or you can download it online. Um, so please do that and make and make use of that resource. And then uh, one of the fun projects I've been working on this winter has been to develop a podcast. So I'm working with some partners at Mizzou and North Dakota State and we're just talking with different weed scientists and agronomists around the country about information that will help you guys win the war against weeds. So this week we talked with a consultant 
from North Dakota and that episode is out. And I think some of your agents online this morning have already listened to it and given it a good review. So I would encourage you guys to listen to this. Uh, we wanna hear from you guys how we can make it better and how it's helping you. So with that, um, I thank you for your time and your attention. And I really sincerely mean it when I say, I hope you'll reach out um, either through social media or feel free to email me. Um, but don't don't leave, don't forget your county or district agent. They're they're your first line of first line of contact for K State. But um, I do love working with producers and and look forward to getting to know some of you all hopefully in person in the future. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. And again, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q and A box. And we're going to move right into uh, Vipin. So, Bippin, if you want to go on and share your slides. Okay. And again, those are on YouTube. Go on and type your questions in YouTube as well, and then we'll get those answered at the end here. Um, and I know that it's 1116 now, so if we go a little bit over, um, we will get your questions answered. Um, if, if not here on the uh, crop talk, we will get those answered from each of the specialists. So, okay, Bippin, go right on ahead. Okay, can you see the slide, Sandra? Yes, but you need to put it in presentation mode. Uh, yes, it is. In there the you go. Oh, okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vipin Kumar. I'm a weed scientist based in Hayes Ag Experiment Station. So Sarah has uh, provided a very good overview of uh, layer residuals or herbicides, the importance of those herbicides uh, in managing weeds in different cropping systems and how different factors and environmental factors affect uh, those residuals in the soil. For my talk, I'm going to focus on uh, managing palmer amaranth, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, challenging weed for Kansas folks, and uh, going to show some of the illustrations or examples with the data we generated over the years in western and central part of the state. So to start with, I'd really like to uh, give a little introduction on palmer amaranth. You, are, you guys are very much familiar with the palmer amaranth and it is one of our uh, pigweed family members. And uh, why Palmer amaranth has become such a big deal or such a big management concern for folks, uh, there are a lot of biological features this weed species possess that really help it to adapt different kinds of strategies we use to manage it. So what are those biological traits are? Palmer amaranth shows extended period of emergence Right here in central Kansas or western Kansas, we start seeing Palmer somewhere like early part of May or mid-May, whenever we see some rain uh, and some good temperatures in the ground. And this uh, weed species keeps coming throughout the summer and even late summer or early fall, we see flushes coming there. Uh, so extended period of emergence is, is one of the trait. It makes it more challenging to control Palmer amaranth throughout the season. The next one is uh, aggressive growth. If the conditions are right, high temperature, good enough moisture in the ground, so palmer can grow very, very rapidly. It can grow about an inch uh, per day, and it really becomes so big in in you know uh, lesser time that you can still planning on herbicide application, and your palmer size is already a foot tall or two foot tall. So aggressive growth and then third trade is the seed production. So a single plant or single mother plant or female plant can produce a, like up to a million seed if it is growing in a non-competitive conditions like a fallow situations. So, and it also has a high outcrossing potentials. It can, uh, you know, transfer the genetic material or the genes from field to field and even within a field. So you see all these biological traits make it very, very uh, adaptive to all kinds of strategies we use to manage it. And it also uh, help this weed species to become more prone to develop herbicide resistance because herbicide tools are the major tools we use to manage it. 
So since 2014, we have been uh, doing a project, uh, leading a project statewide survey of uh, collecting palmer amaranth or pigweeds uh, and to see the distribution and frequency of uh, herbicide resistance in those uh, palmer amaranth populations. If you see in this slide, you can see uh, we have collected palmer amaranth almost two third of part of Kansas in western and central part of Kansas and some collections from northeast uh, side of uh, the state from soybean fields, as well as we have some collection on common water hemp from soybean production areas in the southeast part of the state. So the idea is to see the response of these population and monitor from years to years, like how they respond to our commonly used herbicides so that we can plan ahead in terms of our management strategies. So it's an ongoing project. So I'm not going to share all the results, what we have so far, but really going to emphasize that so far we have documented, uh, you know, different population from South Central Kansas that has shown multiple resistance. The resistance to not only to glyphosate, but resistance to other chemistries as well. We have documented that 2,4-D resistance exists in these, some of these populations, and you see resistance to other chemistries like Glean, Atrax, Callisto, and 2,4-D is, is also exist uh, in those, uh, those uh, documented populations. So multiple resistance uh, is, is really a challenge in, in, in this weed species. And you can see some of the pictures here. The, the palmer amaranth in a greenhouse has survived the the field use rate of 2,4-D uh, and, and is able to produce seeds even in the greenhouse. So you can see those, those resistance traits are heritable from generation to generation. It's moving on and uh, has made this weed species really, really challenging. Okay, my first poll question is based on what I have just talked about. What you guys think to which of the following herbicides Palmer amaranth has developed resistance in Kansas? And the options are glyphosate, atrazine, mesotrione, 2,4-D, or all of the above or none of the above. What do you guys think in central Kansas, what has been happening with glyphosate or atrazine resistance or mesotrione resistance? or even 2,4-D resistance. Okay, 88% participant has voted all of the above and 13% said glyphosate. Of course, glyphosate resistance is quite common in uh, field population of Palmer amaranth but all of the above, we have documented case of uh, all these four chemistries in Kansas. Very good. Okay, that's we know, you guys know, multiple resistance exists and resistance to those chemistries exist in Palmer amaranth in Kansas. So what are the strategies? How are we gonna manage it? Uh, so first of this, one of the first study I'm gonna show is some of the programs we evaluated in Enlist soybean or Enlist E3 soybean. As you most of you know, uh, there are new generation of stack trade technologies came into the market, including Enlist bean or Extend beans or even now Extend Flex beans. So uh, because they are resistant to multiple herbicide sites of actions, you can spray uh, you know, in Enlist soybean 2,4-D glyphosate and glufosinate but we have a case of 2,4-D resistance and glyphosate resistance already existing in, in the part of the state. So what options or what strategies we need to adopt to maintain or sustain these technologies for the longer time? So that was the main idea of doing this study to understand and evaluate different programs that can be integrated with this technology to, to keep going in terms of managing these multiple resistant Palmer amaranth. So this study we did in Hayes, this is uh, uh, my graduate student uh, thesis research. He has done this study in 2019 and 2020. And actually this was uh, done in Hayes Ag Experiment Stations. And he used uh, one of those uh, Palmer amaranth population that showed resistance to 2,4-D glyphosate, atrazine, mesotrione, and chlorosulfuron. So this population was a five-way resistance, what he used in this study. 
So the programs we investigated in this study was the pre-applied uh, programs, things like Sonic, Trivance, Authority Supreme, Authority MTZ, Panther Pro or Fierce XLT or Boundary. These are you know, recently available uh, two to three way pre-mixtures uh, applied as a pre for in soybean. So we wanted to see as a standalone pre-programs, how they perform on those uh, five-way resistant Palmer amaranth. And then we had a set of uh, pre followed by post programs. In the post treatments, we included three-way mixtures of Enlist-1, Durango, which is a glyphosate, and Liberty, which is a glufosinate. So because it's an Enlist soybean, we can spray those uh, three-way mixtures. So uh, as you see, the pre-treatments were done or applied on May 21st and post-programs were applied on June 23rd. So this is, I'm just showing the results from 2020. I haven't shown the results for 2019. Here, you can clearly see majority of these pre-programs were working pretty good in early ratings, like, you know, by 18th June. They were providing almost 90, 95% control. And then some of those programs start declining over the time. And especially these ones, Authority Supreme or Authority MTC, and even, uh, you know, the boundary, uh, it, 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 the herbicides, so they decline in terms of Palmer amaranth control. But all the pre followed by post programs provided pretty good effective control, about 90 to 95% control across all the ratings. So, uh, what it tells that if you really want to manage those resistant farmer in enlist or extend soybean, you definitely need some good pre programs followed by a, a one treatment or post uh, chemistries or tank mixtures of those label compounds. Here is a picture of authority MTZ pre alone. This is a, a standalone program of July. And if you guys know, in July, we got quite a bit of rainfall last year. And you can see that a 30 MTZ kind of dissipate with those moisture and we still had Palmer amaranth in some of those plots with the standalone programs. However, when we had a post program, followed up post program of Enlist One, Durango and Liberty, the plots were looking like, like, like this. Okay, moving on, uh, we know we have herbicide tools that we can use uh, in managing those resistant population, but we are getting out of those tools as well. So the interest among the grower is, is integrating some other methods of weed control and cover crops is, is in high interest among growers. So, so we wanted to see how we can integrate cover crops in our systems in the central and western part of the state where the moisture is always a limiting factor uh, and can still help controlling Palmer amaranth. So the project was again my graduate student, graduate student thesis research. He did this study in 2019 and 2020 and uh, wanted to see the integrated effect of cover crops with the herbicide programs in managing multiple resistant Palmer amaranth in soybean. So he did this study at Hayes Ag Experiment Station and uh, on a grower field in Great Bend. And uh, he used extend beans for this, this study. So basically he used two different types of cover crops. He used uh, cereal rye at Great Bend and winter wheat in Hayes. And uh, <clears throat> those were fall planted cover crops, okay? So fall planted cover crops at both sides, he terminated in early spring, like middle of April and early May, and then middle of May with different herbicide programs and then planted soybean to really see the impact of those cover crop residue along with herbicides, how they suppress those Palmer amaranth. So here is a list of herbicide uh, programs he investigated. So there were pre-programs, uh, well, first treatment was just straight roundup, just burn down those cover crops. And then we had, he included some pre-programs like Panther MTZ, Authority Supreme and Fierce XLT. And then he had some pre followed by post programs. So including uh, those pre-programs and then a follow-up treatment of roundup and extend IMAX a mixture, a single post treatment. So three termination times, as I mentioned, he had uh, late April or mid April and then early May and mid May. So, because you know that 
the time you delay those terminations, there is a more chance of accumulation of uh, cover crop biomass. So that's what we wanted to see how much delay we can do in terms of termination of those cover crops and can get good biomass for suppression of those Palmer amaranth seedlings. Uh, in terms of herbicide application, he put pre's in combination with each of those terminations and post treatment on June 28th in 2019 and June 26th in 2020. So we collected uh, different kinds of data, soybean injury, soybean yield, Palmer amaranth control, and uh, Palmer amaranth density and, and biomass throughout the season in both year. So here is some results, the cover crop biomass. It's, it's, it's a haze site you can see on the left side, the three termination timings, mid-April, early May and mid-May. As we delay the termination, we see more and more biomass of winter wheat, you know, which is expected. And same case was in the cereal rye at Great Bend site that third termination produced significantly more biomass or cover crop biomass compared to the first two Termination. So more biomass accumulation means we will have more residue on the ground to suppress those palmer amaranth seedlings. We also found that uh, the termination timing had a significant effect on the palmer amaranth density. So as you see here, uh, you know, delaying those terminations to towards mid-May reduced the palmer amaranth density significantly compared to the first two terminations. The first two termination had four to five plants per square meter. Here we have one plant per square meter. And here is some picture showing that uh, results. Early termination, mid termination, you can see a lot of palmer amaranth, but late terminations, we had you know, few palmer amaranth in those uh, uh, last termination. In terms of uh, herbicide programs, they were also significant in terms of reducing the palmer amaranth density. If you see all the pre-programs or pre-followed by post-programs reduce the Palmer amaranth density compared to just glyphosate burn down program, okay? But uh, pre-followed by post-programs were most more effective compared to some of these uh, pre-standalone programs. And this picture shows that where we had a 30 plus, a th uh, Roundup plus a 30 stream, just a pre program with the standard burn down of Roundup. We had more Palmer amaranth plants compared to where we had pre followed by Roundup uh, with extend uh, IMAX post treatment. Pretty good clean plot. Similar kind of results we observed in Great Bend. Uh, the previous slides were for, were for from, uh, from Hayes and this is a slide from Great Bend. Similar kind of results you can see uh, wherever we had pre programs and then follow up post treatment significantly reduce the density of Palmer amaranth. So the difference you can see that in terms of uh, Palmer amaranth density in haze was four to five plants. Here we were working with 45 to 50 plants per square meter, highly dense uh, population of, uh, of Palmer amaranth in Great Bend. In terms of yield, we didn't see much difference in yield among those three terminations at Great Bend site, but we saw decline in yield with the with the uh, in haze, especially there was a significant decline in the yield uh, with the third termination at haze, which you can expect because haze is a little more drier than Great Bend. And uh, as you delay the termination of those cover crops, you will definitely see some of the moisture being used and that will translate into the, into the soybean yield. So uh, Sarah has uh, given a lot of emphasis in, in her talk on uh, layer residuals and uh, the importance of layer residual in terms of uh, managing uh, these uh, weed species in our system. So I'm gonna give us some examples, some data, I'm gonna show some data here, uh, the importance of overlapping residuals for controlling multiple resistant Palmer amaranth in, uh, in Roundup Ready and Liberty Link corn in central Kansas. So this study was also performed in two years, 2018 and 2019. And uh, this was on a grower field who had a complaint about glyphosate and mesotrione resistant Palmer amaranth in corn. Again, uh, this study was done on two years and this corn was under irrigated, uh, sprinkler irrigated uh, site. So uh, 
here is a list of uh, chemistries or programs we investigated. This is a little uh, <clears throat> busy slide in terms of uh, the text, but you can really see here, we had three set of treatments, pre alone programs. We just sprayed one time, and then we had pre followed by early post programs where we included uh, some of the residual chemistries or overlapping residuals in our post treatment as well, uh, along with the pre programs. And then we had pre followed by late post program, similar scenarios, and uh, we included some of those residuals in late post treatment. But one thing you can see here in the last column here, the mode of actions, we have been using four to five different herbicide mode of actions in those chemistries. So you can see how difficult or how um, this uh, tank mixtures have been changing with the, with the evolution of multiple resistance in Palmer amaranth. Uh, and that's what, that's what is increasing our cost of uh, weed control as well. So uh, all these programs were uh, sprayed with the uh, adjuvants, uh, appropriate adjuvants, and uh, uh, pre-programs were applied at, at the time of planting, early post like three to four weeks after pre's and late post about two weeks after late, uh, early post treatments in both years. So here is some data from those programs. You can see here, again, you can categorize those programs, just pre-program you see, they were pretty good in early ratings, but they declined over the time uh, throughout the growing season. This is the average data for both years, by the way. You can see the last rating we had 70 to 75, uh, 77% control. But all the pre followed by early post program, you can see were pretty consistent in terms of control and gave pretty good control. Although it's not 98 or 100%, was somewhere between 90, 92% control, even including with those soil residual chemistry with early post programs. And in terms of yield, we didn't see much difference in yield with all those programs, but they were all significantly, significantly better than non-treated control. So here is a picture showing the one of the pre-program of Clarity, Corvus, Atrex, and Roundup. Uh, this is a five weeks after pre. You can see still Palmer amaranth uh, plants growing in those rows uh, in that plot. However, when we had pre followed by early post program, the plot looked pretty clean uh, at five weeks after pre or two weeks after early post treatment. Just want to emphasize a little bit here in terms of the economics. A lot of folks been calling me and asking me questions like, okay, I'm gonna make my own Lumax, Lexar, or those kind of remixes. And this is the cost of generic, uh, you know, asmatolachlor or, or atrazine, how this is gonna be, you know, working out in terms of building its own tank mixtures or pre-mixtures. So, one thing I have noticed using these chemistries or evaluating these chemistries is the economics is really something that plays a big part in terms of herbicide resistance management. But as I mentioned, using those five to six different mode of action, even are giving us 90, 92% control. And Sarah mentioned, even if you know, some of the weed escapes late season can produce millions of seeds. If you're really looking towards resistance management, we really need to look you know, beyond these herbicide tools. We need to do more than what we are doing now. So here you can see among those programs, <clears throat> the gross incomes, you can see a lot of you know, uh, significantly different uh, uh, between those herbicide programs and non-treated where we did not do anything. We didn't invest any money and we had some improvement in terms of our gross income and even with the net returns. But when we are adding more and more chemistries, you can see the cost is also increasing. Although our gross income is kind of consistent with other programs and net return is decreasing compared to some of our best treatments. So economics is something like really play a key role uh, in, in, in management or resistance management. And I think that's what we need to think about like we need to think beyond these herbicide tools. We need to do uh, or need to integrate some other programs or other methods to really uh, 
control the seed bank of these resistant population or resistant palmer amaranth in our systems. Some of the work we did in wheat stubble, we've been uh, getting a lot of calls for in terms of managing glyphosate resistant palmer amaranth in wheat stubbles. And uh, this is a study been done in Hayes Experiment Station 2019 and 20. And uh, we have tested a number of chemistries, number of burn down uh, potential chemistries that can be used or that can be used in place of glyphosate if you have been dealing with the glyphosate resistant Palmer amaranth. So both here we sprayed these uh, chemistries when Palmer was pretty tall, two to three feet tall, and they were you know, starting producing seeds, they were producing flowers. And uh, we included some of the chemistries here in our programs, uh, things like you know, our standard burn down, like Roundup Clarity 24D or two-way mixture of Roundup Clarity or 24D. And then we had Gramoxone based programs, Gramoxone or Paraquat alone, or with uh, some soil residual chemistries like Atrax, Sencor, Valor, 24D, or even Spartan Authority Supreme and Panther MTC. So the idea was to include those soil residual chemistries late season so that we can prevent some of the late season flushes of Palmer amaranth when we get the rainfall. So from this study, what we found was Gramoxone based program was pretty consistent, all Gramoxone alone and you know, along with the tank mixtures of uh, three programs of Gramoxone were pretty consistent in terms of controlling Palmer amaranth or those bigger, taller, taller Palmer amaranth uh, late season. Along with the Gramoxone, we also see similar kind of response with the Liberty-based tank mixtures like Liberty 24D and Roundup was also pretty consistent in terms of controlling those Palmer in wheat stubble. One thing I like to emphasize here, all these programs were applied with appropriate adjuvants like crop oil or MSO at high rates as, for, as dictated by the label because we were dealing with the bigger Palmer plants at that time of the year. So we included all those uh, adjuvants as appropriate as per the label. Okay, some of the slides I'm gonna share now is, uh, is controlling volunteer uh, corn in, uh, in, in less soybeans. So as uh, some of the folks, they have a corn soybean rotation in central Kansas and uh, growing in less corn and in less soybean because those traits are available in both crops, there could be a problem of volunteer corn in, in, uh, in, uh, in less soybeans. So what options do we have in managing those in list corn in, in list soybean. So before we jump into some of the treatments and results, I'd like to emphasize here, this is in list corn developed by Corteva Agri Sciences and it's resistance to 2,4-D glyphosate and glufosinate, just like our in list soybean, but it's also resistance to one of the group one herbicides called uh, FOP or Cuzalofop herbicide in, in corn. So it's not only those three-way mixture resistance, but it's a resistance to grass herbicide also. So that limits our uh, options in terms of uh, grass control options in soybean. So we did this study in Hayes, uh, simulated study. We planted uh, in list corn in, in list soybean, and we tested these programs. So this, the treatments we selected was Select Max, which is another class of group one herbicides. Select Max and then Post Plus. So uh, Select Max is a clithodim and Post Plus is thoxidim. And we use at, uh, you know, standalone program. And then we had tank mixtures of those Select Max and Post Plus with Enlist One. Because some of the growers gonna use that Enlist One for Palmer amaranth and other broadly weed species along with that grass control. So we had two different timings of those programs, early post, that was V3 to V4 stage of corn. And then a similar set of treatments as a late post, uh, which was like V7 or V8 stage of uh, corn. Some results here, you can see select max and uh, post plus standalone treatments provided pretty good control uh, throughout the season. And, uh, but when you had post plus within list, it antagonized the control of volunteer corn in, in, in soybean. You can see the control declined significantly compared to select max or 
post plus uh, standalone programs in early post treatments. However, the late post treatments were, uh, you know, not as effective as the early post treatments. Uh, so the take home from this study is basically, if you really want to control those volunteer corn uh, in soybean, go with early post treatments and go with like a standalone programs. You don't need to mix and list one with those if you can. That will be my, my take home from this study. And here is some pictures. You can see select max itself and then select max within list one. You still see some corn plants here and there. And this is post plus by itself and then post plus with the in list one. You can see difference here in terms of, uh, you know, the control failures with some of the corn plants, they came back compared to post plus uh, treatment. That's all I have. I uh, would like to entertain any question. If you have any questions later on, you can shoot me an email. You can follow me on Twitter and uh, you can call my office number as well. But uh, I would suggest to, to talk to your county agents first if you have a local question and uh, I'll be happy to, to answer any question at any time. Thank you. Okay, um, I will turn that over to Craig. I think Craig's gonna look for any questions. Are you seeing any yet, Craig? I do not have anything on Zoom, so I don't know if Aaron has anything on YouTube. Okay, okay. I don't have anything on YouTube yet, but give me okay. a few All right, uh, we're gonna go on and finish this up. If you have more questions, if you will just go on and put those in your um, chat. Or on the, uh, let me share this here. And I will share my screen. Okay, here is the certified crop advisor QR code. So if you have that on your um, phone, please go on and scan that in and then you will get your CCA credits. Or remember, if you don't have the app on your phone, um, you can just uh, email your name and your CCA number to Jeannie at Jeannie Folk Jones. And I think if Craig will put her uh, email in the chat box there, and then you'll have that. Remember you were supposed to have done that at the beginning and at the end. And hopefully you all did that um, if you didn't have the QR code. So I'll leave that up there for just a few more seconds. So you all can see that. And Jeannie had put her uh, email right at the bottom of the slide there. So it's jfalkjones at kstate.edu. We will put that back up, but we'd like to thank you for participating uh, in our virtual crop talk today and last week too. Uh, we do have an, if you know, if you go to any of our meetings, um, mine and I'm sure all the other extension agents too, we do have an evaluation. We truly do ev um, um, like your evaluations because um, it helps us for future programming as well and see how we're doing. So if you could, um, we'll put the link in the chat box right there. You simply click on it. It's very simple. There's only three questions. It won't take you very long at all. Um, and they're also putting that in the YouTube um, if you're watching it on YouTube as well. Okay, uh, join us next Tuesday. Um, and it will be on corn insect resistance. Uh, specifically the rootworm and the western bean cutworm. And again, it will be uh, at 10.30 to approximately 11.30 Central Standard Time. And it will be Tuesday, February 16th. So is there any questions coming in, Craig or Aaron? None so far here. And so far? Okay. Um, Vipin's answering the one that came in directly, so... Okay. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and ask that one? Maybe everybody else would like to hear. It says on Palmer amaranth density slides for haze and grape bin, there's a little difference between the three weeks after post and the harvest densities at haze, but significant differences at grape bend. Do you have any idea on why that would be Vipin? 
Yeah, uh, that's a good question, Jeannie. Uh, <clears throat> we saw that difference and uh, I, I see the main difference was probably because of a difference in, in the flushes or the cohorts we saw in, in Hayes versus Great Bend. And I think the moisture in Great Bend was a little higher end uh, than, than Hayes. So we observed multiple flushes in Great Bend compared to Hayes. We had one or two flush we observed early season and that's it. So that's why you've been seeing the changes or differences in Great Bend towards the end of the harvest compared to Hayes. So definitely okay. it looks like it's pretty close, but there, we have observed over two years, there's a little difference between central and south central Kansas versus what, where we are in terms of annual precip we get. And uh, that's, that makes differences in, in farmer emergence. Okay, okay. Uh, we had a YouTube question come in. Um, did you use any Reviton in trials yet? I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I have not, I have not looked at it yet. Okay. Any other questions that are coming in? Is a new PPO from Helm for burn down in wheat stubble? Is that new? Have you heard of that, Pippin? I have not, but um, PPO, uh, we have used some of the things like, uh, you know, Valor uh, in our burn down programs. And that really helps. Uh, we have seen some uh, residual activity from those uh, PPOs uh, on Palmer Amaranth. So adding a PPO at, during that time of the year will be, a, will be a good thing to add. But I haven't looked at the how uh, in specifically. In okay. All righty, great. Any other questions? Because I know we're running late. It looks like there's one more question coming in. It is a non-selective herbicide for the pre-plant burn down and desiccation segments. Oh, in field corn, cotton, and soybeans and wheat. So okay. that was just information. Okay. okay. Cool. Okay. Alrighty, great. Alrighty. Well, I think that uh, concludes it. I know we're running just a little bit late. We again appreciated you being with us. And again, if you could do that evaluation, that would certainly help us. And we will see you next Tuesday, February 16th. Thanks.